Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In our last seminar recording, we dealt exclusively with questions in the area of art. And this evening, I'm again with a few members of the previous group, and again, we're going to confine our discussion exclusively to the realm of art, to the realm of aesthetics. So let's get the ball rolling with the first question. Thank you, Dr. Brandon. Can an artist deliberately lie through his art and concretize a point of view with which he is not in sympathy? If he can, what are the idea that a work of art is a psychological confession? Well, even if an artist could so successfully lie that he could, with great persuasiveness, represent a point of view other than his own, this disqualify the general assumption that a work of art is a psychological confession because the context in which such a statement would be made is the assumption of the normal process by which art is created, namely that an artist is choosing to express something that he wishes to express. Now the fact that somebody might be able to produce a fake doesn't invalidate that general observation which is obviously intended to apply not to a situation where somebody is setting out consciously to fake or misrepresent but where he is doing what artists ordinarily do in the pursuit of their art. Now, as for whether or not an artist can successfully lie, well, certainly there have been painters who were master imitators of the style of other painters. So, judging from that, we'd have to say, yes, it can be done. I have a feeling it might be a little bit harder to do as successfully in literature. In fact, for reasons I don't claim to understand or to be able to express at this moment, I have the hypothesis that it would be much harder to produce as good an imitation of a writer's work as it seems to be possible to produce imitations of artists, meaning painters' work. But that's sort of an aside. Does an author's neurosis deeply influence his style? If it does, how is the influence manifested? One couldn't answer that as a generality. I would say it depends on the nature of the neurosis. It might influence the artist's style in one case and not in another. The assumption that if an artist is neurotic, it will necessarily affect his style, I'm inclined to think is a mistaken one. So much would have to do with the nature of the neurosis, I think. Therefore, I don't think one could make a generality from that. Oscar Wilde once wrote, There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well-written or badly written, that is all. Do you agree? And if not, how would you morally evaluate a book in which the subject matter presents an evil view of existence and the style presents a profoundly rational view of human consciousness? Well, I don't morally evaluate books. I morally evaluate human actions. Therefore, I would say that the first error is to ask, how do I morally evaluate a book? You might say that a book preaches a view that you consider to be immoral, by which you might mean would have harmful consequences for human beings if they adopted it. That's the only sense in which I think a person could talk about an immoral book. But uh, I really wouldn't care to talk about books as moral or immoral, only human actions, and maybe human beings, but not inanimate objects. If an artist creates a work so complex and so abstruse that no one can understand it, even though it would be possible to understand it, is it a work of art? If it is, does it suffer as a work of art from this limited understanding? Well, I have to say I find that an extraordinary question. To begin with, I can't understand how you claim that if nobody can in fact understand it, you're also claiming that in theory it is understandable. If you're writing it for human beings existing in the real world, and absolutely nobody is able to understand what you have said, then I would say you have failed the task of communication which is inherent in the uh, artistic enterprise. The projection of some imaginary elite who might be able to understand what nobody living can, I find a very dubious idea. Therefore, I would say if literally nobody living can understand the work of art, there is something defective in the work of art unless you take a modern 20th century artist and place him into some primitive jungle where nobody can understand what he's doing because they have no common context of knowledge. But that's kind of a fantasy example, and I don't think that's what you meant. We cannot claim or expect that everybody is going to equally well understand the given work of art, but if nobody understands it, the artist 
to my way of thinking, would have to say, I failed. I failed to communicate. If I'm doing something which allegedly is objective, that means it should be graspable by other human minds. So I would say, yeah, it's a failure. Could a work of art be considered perfect if absolutely everything within that work organized itself around a single theme or organizing principle? That's impossible. A work of art is much too complex. It's not literally possible that, quote, everything in it organizes itself about a single theme or a single principle. I think that's a misrepresent of what is involved in creating a work of art. It's much, much more complex than that. You can say that it is generally the main events and the main characters are organized about a single theme, but you cannot talk that every last aspect of style, punctuation, choice of every word is all directly related to one single theme or principle. I mean, I would say that's a little hard to swallow. I really don't even know exactly, to extend my answer a bit longer if I may, I don't even know exactly what is meant by such concepts as, quote, a perfect work of art. I really question what in the hell that means. We can talk about the great work of art, we can talk about the stunningly effective work of art, but to me there is something rather abstract, and I'm now using abstract in this context in a pejorative sense, about the notion of, quote, a perfect work of art. It simply doesn't communicate anything to me. Why are today's heroes and villains almost always involved in stories with excessive violence and little plot? Well, I don't know whether it's literally true that, as you suggest, uh, today's heroes and villains are necessarily involved in excessive violence and too little. But if they are, and to the extent that they are, I would say, first of all, that it's much easier to throw around violence than to devise plot. It's easy. You can always have fights, you can always have chases, which create the illusion of a story, but you don't necessarily have a story structure. You don't necessarily have a plot just because you have people fighting each other, chasing each other, killing each other, jumping off cliffs and crashing through windows. None of that necessarily are the ingredients of plot or story. Very few writers today really seem to know how to write plot. I think it's a very, very difficult art to master. And excessive violence is often a cheap substitute, a way to create the illusion that something is happening. That would be my explanation, anyway. Many admirers of The Fountainhead consider the movie version to have been an artistic failure, yet it was very faithful to the novel. Do you agree or not, and why? I don't agree that it was faithful to the novel. Although Miss Rand herself wrote the movie script, I don't regard the movie script artistically as anywhere near as good as the novel. I think perhaps it's a dreadfully hard burden on an author to ask him or her to adapt work intended for one medium to another. I think it's a dreadfully difficult undertaking. But in any event, I don't consider the script as good a movie script as I consider the novel a great novel, and I doubt that Miss Rand would argue with that, I might mention, because the better a work of art is in one medium, as I think I said in the previous discussion, the less likely it is that it's going to be remotely as good when you try to adapt it to another medium. There are a lot of flaws in the picture. The directing is very, very poor. The acting is nowhere good enough for the lines. You don't believe anybody in that story except uh, Robert Douglas, who plays Ellsworth Tui, I think is the most convincing. He's the one character who most of the time makes you believe that he knows what he's saying, and you can really believe those sentences coming out of that mouth. But you don't believe Cooper, you don't believe Massey, and you don't believe Patricia Neal most of the time. Now, there are some individual scenes in which they're better. But taking the movie as a whole, I think the movie is very interesting. I think it's most likely to be enjoyed by someone who has not read the book. If you read the book and you like the book, to see that a movie was made, it can be fun to watch, but it's not the same thing artistically, and I would say that in many ways it doesn't fully work as a movie. Too much story is compressed. They didn't have enough time. You know, in those days they didn't make three, four-hour movies like they do today. It was under two hours. Well, for a story of that complexity, that was really pitiful, and that was just the way things were done in those days. I remember Ms. Ryan telling me that she wanted to open up the screenplay at a later point in the story to give herself more time, in effect, roughly in part two rather than part one. 
but the producers were terribly anxious to take her up from the beginning because